Hello, thanks for joining me. My name is Gary Knoll. I work in Esri's professional services department. Uh, I'm a web developer. I've been in that position for about the past 10 years. I think similar to many of you, I use uh, Esri's public SDKs and APIs to build applications for RGIS customers. Um, in this section, I'm going to discuss how we built the virtual inspection studio. So what exactly is the Virtual Inspection Studio? It's uh, a web application we built uh, and designed for insurance companies. It harnesses the power of imagery to improve response time and efficiency during a catastrophe. So when a catastrophic event such as a fire, flood, or hurricane occurs, this app is intended to enable insurers to respond uh, more quickly and efficiently to their customers' needs. This may sound familiar to you if you were with us in San Diego last summer at the user conference. USAA was on the plenary stage talking about their apps and tools used to respond to catastrophic events and uh, the virtual inspection studio had, had some airtime. However, I think I've talked about the app enough without showing it off. I think we better get into a demo. Okay, let's uh, let's log into the virtual inspection studio. So I'm prompted to uh, log in with my enterprise credentials. Um, as you can see, this is hosted by the NICB Geospatial Intelligence Center. They're actually a group which supports um, and builds tools for multiple insurance companies. Uh, and they're hosting this application. So as you notice, there's no data when we log in rather than the, other than the base map and a you know, notice on this left-hand panel saying this list is empty, upload some locations. Um, and due to the fact that they support, the GIC supports multiple insurance companies, um, we're not directly integrating with their, with their policy feature layers. So this app requires them to upload location or policy information via a CSV file. There is a secondary version of the application meant for on-premise deployment for insurance companies that want uh, customizations or more direct integration with their um, with their own data. But for now, let's let's focus on this. But that was a kind of a design. Uh, consideration when when building out the code base. Okay, so let's uh, let's upload some data. So we built this little wizard to walk us through the uh, location import process. We select a CSV file with either latitude, longitude, or address information. We're asking Enterprise to review the document and let us know what fields it thinks are valid for address or lat longs. As we proceed, this creates a, um, the JSON definition for a feature layer with um, client side data. And that we're now prompted to name the data set, uh, which we can use in the application later. This is, these are houses in Malibu. We're required to specify at least one uh, display field, which uh, we'll use in the location list and fields for the pop-up. Excellent. So after importing those locations, we zoom the map, uh, populate the list, and as I hover over each item, the list highlights and on the map we kind of fade out the other locations and um, add a little hover color to the location on the map. We have this location details button which will launch us into a six map view of the property. So on the right upper right hand side we have uh, imagery, aerial imagery which was flown uh, directly over, so Nader imagery of 
that location just after a fire and on the left hand side we have nadir imagery taken uh, before the fire and so each one of these maps has the option to change the date so we have a date and time of each um, image in the map and then down low uh, we're showing uh, oblique imagery so imagery at a shot at an angle so the plane flies over and the camera is let's say at a 45 degree angle um, and we have you know north south east west directions that uh, the image was from so we we give the user a very good look at the property without uh, having to click around really so in this page they see a lot of information if they need to inspect um, one map in particular a bit more detailed you can expand the map and that brings up measurement tools uh, for doing some sort of reporting on area or roof um, roof size a lot of hail damage type activity um, things of that nature that can be done on that page so the goal of this exploration is for the user to eventually make some sort of uh, assessment of the property um, damage severity could be a total loss in this case now um, the insurance company no longer has to send out uh, an inspector to the property which saves time and money and lets this person get back to their life uh, sooner so as I complete the uh, form I can make some pay claim in full, make some assessments. Uh, and generate a report. So this will create a PDF with my input comments and a image for each of the six uh, maps displayed. Yeah, so with uh, with that PDF, I can send that off to, you know, the next step in the claims process and continue on with my work. And that's, that's the whole workflow. Uh, I guess we do track some status and, you know, we indicate that we have reviewed and reported out on that property. And uh, then we just carry on and, and move through the list. Um, some other basic tools, but... That's the app in a nutshell. I thought it'd be useful to mention a few uh, guiding design principles that uh, were kind of in the forefront of, of how we built out the app. So first and foremost was the user experience. Um, we knew that these insurance folks were not, you know, remote sensing gurus who understood imagery catalog applications and the ins and outs of all the imagery lingo. Um, so we really wanted to build a, an easy workflow um, to help guide the insurers through that process. And, uh, you know, we had a lot of help from a colleague of mine, Michael Gig. He's a UI UX expert and uh, he led a workshop which brought us through from really a deeper dive into understanding their needs and the you know the final output was a high fidelity mock-up which uh, the development team implemented and uh, mike has a lot of great presentations in these conferences so i I'd, I'd, I'd scan the list and then look for a few of his his topics and you won't be sorry uh, next uh we kind of had to operate with the concept that we'd have a bit more of a plug and play for data sources so as I demonstrated, the upload CSV um, workflow, you know, another option we discussed was the integrate with an organization and their feature layers and, um, you know, how to you know, handle both of those and bring the data in into one unified location list on the left and display them on the map and things like that. So. Um, that was something we wanted to make sure was consistent and then you know 
knowing that the GIC has many different um, customers and we may interact with many different customers for the on-premise deployment, you know, the inputs and output schemas will vary customer to customer and, um, you know, to get around that where we could, we synchronized on kind of a known spec, like the feature layer spec for, um, inputs as well as, um, you know, the report actually, um, when we're inputting that final report on the multi-map screen, that was, um, populated dynamically, but expected different fields to be, um, the field info of a, of a feature layer. So if we had domains for a drop down, it'd be a, a typed feature with a, a coded domain and, and we would use those values and, and that spec to populate the, the drop down. Yeah. As I was saying, we, we leverage the, uh, field info schema to define the reports in the application. So we have an array of, uh, field info objects. Um, damage type is a string. It has a length, uh, it's, you know, 200 characters. We have a roof area, um, has a, you know, name and alias for display roof measurement, square feet. It's of type double. So we know it's a number. Uh, we also are able to leverage code of domains. So we have a code and a name, which gives us the ability to display that in a dropdown. And, um, yeah, so, I mean, that's what we see here. So we have our damage type with a string input roof measurement, which is numerical. I can't type in, uh, alpha characters and damage type has three options. So we know a coded domain can be displayed as a dropdown on the app and notes had a length of 4,000 characters. So we use a, a text area component rather than a, a short string input box. And, you know, we were able to build generic components based on that very simple, uh, object. And now, you know, it's very simple to add a new input form on the UI by simply updating that uh, JSON file. You know, additionally, as we go from a customer that's, you know, on premise, they may say, we want to save this input in a editable feature service. So at that point, we would just point this report component to that feature layer. And as it initialized, it would grab the field infos and auto populate the input user interface and, um, report output. Cause they're all, you know, just basically implementing the, the few permutations of that field info. So it was a really kind of easy way for us to make this report extendable or extensible for, for different customers. I'm sure it's no surprise, uh, to any of us that I'm using the ArcGIS API for JavaScript uh, version 4.x. It's a really hard sell to start anything in 3.x these days. Um, you may not have recognized that I'm using another API library, the Oriented Imagery API. Um, give it a look if you're doing things with imagery that may require something like Street View or, um, you know, oriented imagery. So if you have your smartphone and you're pointing that in a certain direction, that's kind of oriented imagery. So GitHub, Esri org, oriented imagery. Uh, and so what you get is actually this uh, black box here. So it reads uh, ICS image coordinate system and um, does all of the complicated math to combine the location, sensor orientation, all of that jazz and, and makes it look how you'd expect, which is, it's very complicated. Uh, I don't understand it, but luckily they did all the hard work for us. Uh, so this component actually comes with a toolbar by default and has its own zoom in, zoom out, and uh, its own user interface for browsing images at this particular location, which if you look at our app, um, 
you might be unsure, but these these bottom um, oblique images are being displayed in that oriented image reviewer component. So we through some CSS tricks, uh, hid the existing tools and hooked into the JavaScript functions, which execute the uh, zoom, in, zoom in, zoom out, and uh, this image browser is something we we kind of hooked up to look similar to what we display in the the Nader map. So when we select a new image, we basically set an expression, like a, a layer definition expression on on that component. So we, we end up having the ability to um, control which image is displayed in that component. So it actually wasn't terrible to uh, extend and kind of modify the UI for that component. Um, I was perusing the what's new for the ArcGIS for JavaScript API and did notice that the imagery layer now supports um, ICS image coordinate system. So we'd be able to display uh, oblique imagery in a, you know, ArcGIS for JavaScript API map component um, imagery layer. So our next step will probably be to refactor the code to just use a, a normal imagery layer, just so we, we don't have kind of a diverging code base on these bottom images and our top two images. But um, it's a great a great library if, if you're dealing with oriented imagery and it does support oblique imagery as well as, as you see here. Yeah, under the hood, you know, just uh, framework wise, React, uh, very popular and we do leverage Redux to manage kind of some complicated application state. I know that's you know not always required for um, smaller applications but as this grew it became obvious that uh, it's it'd be nice to have to, to organize that uh, application state in Redux. Yeah it's true you know we we made some mistakes in, in the process and uh, I always find it interesting to to hear what other people struggled with and how they got around them. So I'll talk about a few items here real quick. Uh, so if you recall, uh, in this part of the app, the user can toggle the base map and um, this loads a web map so any sort of additional operational layers are here and we can toggle visibility and um, a user would expect that to persist throughout the application session. So um, we had a problem where we would go into location details and um, just the way we have our kind of React routes set up, um, that previous screen would be, you know, recycled or, you know, unloaded so when we went back uh, in a previous iteration of the code we'd have to reinitialize the map component um, the default base map would be set even if I toggled away from it and if I had modified a uh, operational layer that whole thing was lost and I didn't really want to repress you know reinitialize everything after coming back. So what we did instead was uh, leveraged um, styled components. So, you know, we're, we're hiding that component through CSS rather than uh, your typical React route. So we do flip, you know, we, we flip a flag as is hidden when we uh, navigate to the detailed page and the container for the overview, which uh, holds the list and map, uh, goes into you know CSS hidden mode. And you know similarly, when we were looking at how to expand and collapse these other maps, you know we had the option to remove everything from the screen, 
and bring it back, but we ended up just using uh, kind of CSS grid to um, just put one on top of the other so that way we're not uh, you know pulling them in and out of the DOM and re reinitializing everything. So um, that was something I found to be interesting with, with maps and as remap in particular, it does kind of suffer a little bit of a wait time on initial, uh, on, a, on initialization. So if you do have uh, applications which have a map and people are going in and out of map mode, um, if there is a need to persist the state of that map, uh, layers and base maps and visibility and extent, uh, all of that stuff, it may just be easier to hide the map rather than kind of doing the, the kind of natural um, React uh, framework thing, which is to you know, not render that component. So uh, I think that's that's all I have. I've, I hope you've found this useful and uh, if you could or have a desire to provide feedback, um, yeah, follow the, the Esri events um, app and uh, provide your feedback. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.